Okay, okay. Hello, good evening. Um, contrary to what it says there, I'm actually not at Yale. Um, I'm uh, Peter Cherry, Assistant Director for Ottoman and Contemporary Turkey at the British Institute of Ankara. Um, and we're delighted um, to have such an event this evening, which we're co-organising with our friends at ARIT, American Research Institute in uh, Turkey, um, which we share, share, a, share a building with. Um, so, um, without further ado then, um, I also just say hello to everybody on Zoom as well. Um, so you should also be able to, to join on Zoom as well uh, this evening. Um, I know that we've actually got people tuning in from oh, London, someone from Lancaster messaged me to say they were going to join, out of all places. Um, we've got people from yeah, Newcastle, we've got people from uh, the US as well, so lots of different people, so it's great to have such an audience. And of course, um, in the uh, second city, Istanbul. Um, so, without further ado, let me introduce uh, this evening. So we have Pat Yale, who is the author of this book, Following Miss Bell, Travels Around Turkey in the Footsteps of Gertrude Bell. Um, and let me introduce Pat. So Pat um, studied history at Cambridge University, and after a career in the travel industry, uh, she became a writer focused on Turkey, and she's been living in Turkey for 25 years. So 16 of them was in a cave uh, house in Göreme, Cappadocia, which is uh, quite cool. Um, but now she's based in Istanbul, and um, she's also one of the trustees of the British Community Council of Istanbul, um, who also have been very supportive of some of our work, including the uh, Ferico Protestant Cemetery Initiative. And uh, following this bell is your first, well, it's a travel book. I was going to say it's your, it's, but it's your first non-lonely planet. Book, um, would you say? No, I've written quite a lot of non lonely planet books, but it's the first narrative book. First narrative travel book. So there you go. Okay, without further ado, then let me invite Pat to the stage. All right. Hello, welcome everybody, Hosh Geldiness. Um, I hope you will forgive me if I don't say Tokyo because this book was researched before that change of name. So although I wholeheartedly support the change of name, I find it difficult to remember when I'm a bit stressed. So um, thank you very much for coming. It's a lovely evening, so I didn't have to come out in the rain. Thank you particularly to the British Institute at Ankara and to Farrett for organizing this and particularly to Peter, who's been very helpful in getting it off the ground for me. I'm going to talk to you today about this project that I embarked on in 2015. It was actually sparked in 2014. And I'm going to tell you the story of how we went from this, which was an entry in an Ottoman guest book to this, which is the finished book that was published last September. So to have a look at this, this is the thing that sparked off my interest in Gertrude Bell. Um, it's 2014. It was a very strange day in which I'd been bitten by a dog in Gulhani Park and had spent the whole day looking for the hospital that would do me a rabies jab. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, I'd had my jab and I was relaxing and I was walking along Istiklal and there was an exhibition at the Koch uh, Institute about Osman Hamdi Bey's daughter's guest book. And I thought, oh, well, you know, that's a nice half hour thing to round off the day, nice thing to put all the trauma behind me. And I went in and obviously there were lots of interesting things there. But the thing that jumped out at me was I suddenly saw this entry that had been written by Gertrude Bell at an unknown time, but probably July 1907. And she had written, the most exalted seat in the world is the saddle of a swift, swift horse and the best companion for all time is a book. Now, there's nothing about that that's about Turkey, Turkey, and there's nothing that particularly in itself would have inspired me. But it's interesting how the mind works. And I came out of that exhibition thinking, well, I do vaguely remember that I knew she'd been to Turkey, but I'd never given it any thought. I'd never thought where she'd gone or what she might have done. It just hadn't been in my, my thoughts. 
So now some people in the room I'm aware know a great deal about Gertrude. So it's a bit superfluous to be told these very basic things, but for some who might not, and possibly some people who are on Zoom, Gertrude was born, Gertrude Margaret Lothian Bell. She was born in Washington in County Durham, which is in the Northeast of the UK, in Northeast of England in July, 1868. She was actually born into one of the six wealthiest families in the UK. So she was from a very moneyed background. Her grandfather had founded the chemical and steel works in the northeast of England, and that was the source of the wealth. She traveled extensively in the Middle East, which I think is probably fairly well known. What I thought was that it was less well known that she'd also traveled very extensively in Turkey. She wrote several books, travel books, and two of them are entirely about Turkey, which is why it makes it even more surprising that her time here isn't better known than it actually is. I think the reason is that those two books are academic books and they are actually quite hard to just read. So I think that probably partly accounts for it. According to my research, I decided that she'd visited Turkey at least 11 times between 1889 and 1914. She was a friend of Lawrence of Arabia, who she met in Turkey, and she met the love of her life in Konya. And she died, I would suspect, from suicide in Baghdad in July 1926, and she was buried in Baghdad and her grave is still there. So when I started thinking about Gertrude Bell and thinking, well, to have gone to Osman Hamdi Bey's house to write in a guest book, it's very unlikely that was a first visit because he was an important man in late Ottoman society. And I, then I vaguely remembered that I'd been to see this remarkable building near Aksaray on the hillside, the Chanda Kalise, And I had read something at that time about Gertrude visiting and spending three hours there mapping it, drawing it, photographing it. And as you see here, she said it was bitter hot, got through in three hours. And I had a taxi driver who was itching to leave after three quarters of an hour. So I did. I, so I sort of began to think, well, she was definitely then on the edge of Cappadocia. Then I sent away for this book, The Thousand and One Churches, that she wrote with um, Professor Ramsey about the ruins of Bimbir Khaleesi near Karaman. And inside that book, I found this picture. Whoops. Excuse me this picture of the lost church of St. Amphilochius in Konya. Now, my background was as a guidebook writer to Turkey. So I'd been to Konya any number of times and I thought that I knew the city really well, but I had never seen or heard of this church. So again, it started to make me think, she seems to have seen an awful lot of things in Turkey that are not that well known. If you look at that picture, that's a very strange building that started as a church. You can see that at the bottom. Then it was turned into a masjid. And then finally, it was turned into a watch, a clock tower, before finally in the 1920s being destroyed, demolished. So then I got hold of her three narrative travel books, Persian Pictures, Amirath to Amirath, The Desert and the Sown. And it began to be even clearer to me why, in a way, her presence here was not as well recognized as perhaps it should be because a book calling itself Persian Pictures does not shout half the content of this book is about Istanbul. Amirath to Amirath is a very difficult title. I mean, as far as I can see, that's a quotation I think from Shakespeare and I think it simply means from one uh, ruler to another ruler because she was in Turkey when Abdul Hamid II was overthrown. The Desert and the Sown, that at least does say travels in Palestine and Syria, but nothing there would lead you to think that she had spent a lot of time in Turkey. So of course, next place to go is the Gertrude Bell archive to which I will always be immensely grateful as will everyone who's interested in Gertrude because it put all her letters, diaries and photographs online for everyone to access. So the result of my digging around in the archive and reading the diaries and the letters and then comparing them with, with what I found in the various books, was I concluded she'd made at least 11 visits to Turkey. And I've highlighted in yellow the reason why I say at least, because in 1892, she took the Black Sea Ferry to Trabzon on her way to Iran. Now I could not find anything recording the return trip, but common sense kind of suggests if that's how she got to Iran, she almost certainly came back through Turkey as well, but I can't find the evidence of that. 
So that would mean 12 times. If you look at those visits, you will also see the other thing that became plain to me when I started doing my research was that I was watching the evolution of a tourist to an explorer. And that development is very similar probably to what most of us will have experienced, those of us who are not Turkish born, of coming to Turkey, going to Istanbul, going to some of the great sites, becoming fascinated and then gradually working out and going to more and more and more places. But if you look at her first six visits there, that's pretty ordinary standard tourist stuff. But then you get to 1905 and then it starts to be a whole different ball game. Because in 1905, she was working on her book that became The Desert and the Sown, and she was coming back from Palestine and Syria through the east of Turkey, riding on a horse. And so you start to see when she becomes an actual explorer in Turkey and not just a tourist. So what I did then was I plotted everywhere that I could identify that she'd been onto a map, and then I joined it all up. So this route that I actually followed myself when I was writing the book is not a journey that Gertrude herself ma made. It's a journey that I've created by amalgamating all her journeys. And in the actual book, there are a number of maps that show the routes that she did take, the more complicated routes. But my, my route was an amalgamation of them. And you'll see that it started in Izmir, it went down the coast to Bodrum, then it struck inland across, all the way across to Konya, down to the coast at Salifki, paralleling then basically the border all the way across to Jizre, and then back up through Diyarbakir, through Hassan Cave, through Malatya, Kayseri, Western Cappadocia, and then to Eski Shahir, where she would have caught the train back to Istanbul on several of her journeys. And that was the journey I undertook. I thought it would take three months, it took seven. So <clears throat> what I want to, to try and suggest is that when Gertrude first came here, she was like I was when I first came here. She was a young woman with not a lot, no experience of Islamic culture behind her. So she's arrived, in fact, from Bucharest, where she'd spent the winter, with her Murray's Guidebook. So I went and bought an old Murray's Guidebook to see what was in it. And you'll see that it was very much like the sort of guidebook I would have written myself as a guidebook writer. And if you look at the top on the right-hand side, you'll see they're recommending that you buy your Turkish sweetmeats at Haji Bekir in uh, Bacha Kapasu, which is still open today, and you can still do that. And Gertrude says in one of her diaries or letters that she bought Turkish Delight. She doesn't say where, but from that, I would Im imagine it has to have been that because the mentality of how people use guidebooks tends to be like that. If that's what the guidebook recommends, mostly if you're a first time traveler, you'll go along with that. Still in business today, still going strong. So in my understanding of this was that first night that Gertrude spent in Istanbul when she was 19 was at the Royal Hotel. And this is on Mesruti at Jardasi in Istanbul in Pera. And it's now, the site is now occupied by the Rixos Pera. So this picture shows a slightly more elegant hotel than the Rixos Pera, which is huge. And if you look across again at the guidebook entry, you'll see that they're recommending it for its fine view over the Golden Horn, that it's near the British Embassy. And if you look at the prices, it was 16 to 20 francs to stay in a room there. Um, so I know that from other things that she wrote, that she had a view down to the Golden Horn, that she walked down through Kazan Pasha and took a kike along the Golden Horn. For most 19th century travellers, the most the first place they thought of going when they came to what was then Constantinople was the church then, the church of Hagia Sophia. And I think it's very interesting that the recent changes that have taken place there, which may or may not be familiar to people here, have actually made the situation more like the 19th century than it was before. So under the new arrangements, foreigners can only go into the gallery. You can buy a ticket and go into the gallery and look at the mosaics, but you can't go down into the body of the church mosque, now mosque. And that is exactly how it was when Gertrude visited. At that time, foreign visitors were taken up into the gallery and looked down. And she visited on Kadir Gechisi, which you will all know is the most important possibly day of Ramadan. And I've often thought 
So this was a 19 year old woman from Victorian Britain. She had to have a chaperone with her when she went anywhere. Even if she went to an art gallery in London, she had to have a chaperone. And here she is, she arrives in Constantinople. She goes into this incredible building and she looks down on this great crowd of people, men, obviously, assembled to pray on Kaldigetchesi. And I, I sort of feel that that is the seed of how she went on to fall in love with the Islamic world and become an explorer in the Islamic world. And in many ways, that very much parallels my own experience. I, went, I came to Turkey the first time when I was 19, straight out of school. She came when she was 20, straight out of university because she was so clever that she finished quickly. Um, so I feel that that first experience was probably very similar and probably had that same strong and lasting impact, even if we didn't know it at the time. Gertrude's photographs of Constantinople, Istanbul are not the most important ones. I don't think they're not especially exciting. Some of them are just fairly standard tourist pictures. But this one, I think most people would think is a very interesting picture. This is the Karyo Jami, which we believe will open in three days again um, to the public after lengthy restoration uh, and being turned back into a mosque. But at that time when she visited, look, there's nothing around it at all. Now, you literally could not take that picture because you cannot get the distance at all in any direction. So it's a quite remarkable photograph, I think. Anyway, so the tourist Gertrude sets off and she made many visits to Ephesus. And, you know, I've got this photograph in which it looks like there's nobody there, but that's just because I was up on the wall so you couldn't see the people. But she did actually, she was actually there on her own on one occasion. I've always thought the very funny thing is I did this journey out to the Far East, to Jizre and places like that. And people were saying to me, oh, don't go there. It's very dangerous. The only serious problem I had on the trip was at Ephesus, where I climbed up onto the walls and thought, because someone had told me that it was easy, that I could just follow these walls. And the path ran out and I got completely lost up on this hillside, completely on my own in April when it was about to get dark and there was a howling wind. And I had to phone the man who told me that it was easy and say, oh, please, can you come and rescue me? Which was very embarrassing. But it was less embarrassing than having to call the, the emergency services if I didn't do that. Bergamo, we've all been there. Gertrude went there on a day when she was feeling poorly. Some of the places that she went to in the touristic area of the West were le are less well known. So, for example, Lagina, I've never actually met anybody there. There's a temple of Hecate there, the only one that's been found in Asia Minor, and it was actually excavated by Osman Hamdi Bay. It's a very beautiful site, deserves to have more visitors, really. This one I put in, partly I wanted to show people, this is my, if you were to ask me where do I think is the most interesting archaeological site to visit at the moment, I would say it's Laodicea because the work that's been done there is just remarkable. The first time I went there in the 1990s, it was a pile of rubble, which is what I imagine Gertrude saw. And when I went back later and they were charging to go in, I said to the man on the gate, I don't know why you're charging, it's a pile of rubble. And he said, oh, it's much better. And I said, I very much doubt it. Walked around it and came back and said, well, you're completely right, it is much better. And then every time I've gone since, including most recently in December last year, it has got even better. So the picture on the left is showing an infeum that they just opened and it was to celebrate the centenary of, of the Republic. And on the right, this incredible painted wall that isn't really, I think, technically open, so there was no information. But I couldn't recall seeing anything like that anywhere else. So I was absolutely mesmerized. But <clears throat> then they had put up this very helpful description of the history of the excavations at Laodicea. And I was looking at it, and as someone who had been following Gertrude for a long time, I'm going, hmm, we've got Chandler, we've got Arundel, we've got Charles Fellows, we've got Hamilton, we've got Texier. Men, 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 men. No mention of Gertrude, no women appearing there at all. But then when I had calmed down and unruffled my feathers, I thought that that's why I'm doing this project. Because the trouble is that what she had done is scattered so widely. Why would anybody know that she went to Laodicea? And in fairness, she went very briefly. She, again, it was a miserable cold day. She bumped into a family friend at the station. She didn't really write anything very important about Laodicea. But it's, it's, to me, it said that's why I was doing this project, really. So it was a good thing. 
This is Bodrum Castle, and I've included this because I wanted to show how even when Gertrude went to places that we all go to, she didn't do it in the way we did. So this is a, a quotation from a letter she wrote to her great love, Dick Doughty Wiley, literally days before he died at Gallipoli. So he may not have even seen this. And she was reminiscing about her own visit to Bodrum because he was going to be passing in a ship. And she said, I rode across the bay and walked over the isthmus. She then, in where I've got the ellipsis, she then visited all the sites of Bodrum. Then I walked and rode back. Now, if you think about it, most people these days fly in, bus to their hotel, and, you know, we worked out, I worked out with somebody in Bodrum that she almost certainly walked from Torba on the north side of the peninsula because that's the narrowest point, so it would make the most sense. That's a long walk to make in both directions and go and visit the castle and all the other ruins in one day. She was a remarkable woman. So I can't, obviously, because it was a very big project, so I can only show you little bits of it. But I'm going to mention Konya because Gertrude had in her youth, she had learned to speak Farsi. She spoke six languages and she had a bash at Turkish. She spoke six languages and she had partly translated some of the work of the Mevlana. So when she went to see his burial place, it had a particular meaning for her. She was very happy to have gone there to see it. What she didn't know was that she was going to meet in Konya the love of her life. Dick Doughty Wiley, who was the then consul, British consul in Konya. At that time, there were consuls all over the country, not just in Istanbul and Ankara. Unfortunately, he was married. So, yeah, I mean, there was not a lot of future, I don't think, in that relationship, because it would have required a high-profile divorce, which I think in... Edwardian days would have been very difficult but anyway on the he is on the right and there's his very overdressed wife which reminds you how Gertrude herself would have dressed at home. So my project was mainly about place about where did she go but of course I could not you know she met Dick Doughty Wiley and Konya she also contrary to what the film Queen of the Desert says she also met Lawrence of Arabia, who was her, you know, her life, well, she was a working colleague later on and a friend. She met uh, Lawrence of Arabia at Carchemish, which, as some of you probably know, is a strange archaeological site that is literally straddling the Syrian border. So it's partly in Turkey, partly in Syria. I believe it has actually now opened to the public, but I haven't been back, so I don't know that for sure. Well, at the time that I went there, so it was 2015, this was the time when the Syrian problems were at their height and ISIS was just one kilometre away on the other side of the border. I could not be given permission to visit the site, but I was allowed to spend the night with the archaeologists. And while they were going off to do their work, I was left behind to wash Hittite pottery with mainly, I have to say, Syrian refugees. You can see there, this is Gertrude arriving in Urfa, one of the loveliest places I've seen in Turkey. And I think probably a lot of people would concur with that. I know I would. If you've seen Gulbasha like that in the sun, it's absolutely glorious. But as I say, the book was mainly about place, but it was also, I had seen it as a way to talk about modern Turkish culture and the modern life of Turkey over a wide area. And one of the things that was very interesting for me was that by chance, not by planning, I ended up in Urfa during Ramazan and Ramazan was in July. And that meant people were fasting from 17 hours a day. And in Urfa, that means everyone is fasting, not just one or two people. Everyone is fasting. I did find a couple of sinners corners, but I mean, it was quite clear that you did not publicly eat or drink at all in that period of time. And it was boiling hot. So I actually had to stop my project and have a break and come back because you could not talk to someone at 10 in the morning when you knew they couldn't have a glass of water until the evening in 45 degree temperatures. It's just, it was just inconceivable. So I couldn't really press on, but it was an incredible thing to have experienced. And I was very grateful that I had that opportunity, not least because of this, that I was lucky enough to see. If you look at Gertrude's photographs of the Hassan Pasha Jami, they will show these little pools of water in the courtyard of a mosque absolutely empty, nobody around at all, which is how it had always been when I'd visited before. 
But what I discovered was that in this unbelievable heat of Urfa in Ramazan in July, it completely changed. And from sort of early afternoon onwards, the men would come and roll up their trouser legs and sit with their legs in the water. And the boy children, not really the girl children so much, would swim up and down in the water at the bottom. And if some of you know the Gumruk Hung, in order to discourage anyone drinking tea there, all the tables had been removed. And when they'd been removed, you saw that there was a stream running through that as well. And the same thing would happen. Lots of children would go there and be swimming in that stream. So I felt that the sheer chance of being there in Ramazan gave me an insight that would be def difficult to see again, because as we now know, Ramadan now is going into winter. So it will be a very long time since till that scene can be seen again. Some of you might recognize this is the quarry at Dara from which the stones from Ardin were um, carved. And in Dara, I went into a cafe with this very fine capital you can see from a church that's not there anymore. And I met Hamza Yusuf, who, when I mentioned what, what I was doing, that I was following Gertrude, said to me, my grandfather guided her. So this happened twice in the southeast of Turkey, and it was like time standing still. Now, I thought that probably he probably meant his great grandfather, but I don't know that for sure. Sure, And he had died before Hamza Yusuf had been born. So he only knew this as a thing that his family had passed down, the strange lady who came and was wandering around the churches. So <clears throat> the two academic books Gertrude wrote about Turkey, the first one I know some of you will know very well, The Thousand and One Churches about Bimbikulise. The second one is about Tur Abdin, which is the area around Midiat, which is a very little known area, given the wealth of attractions there, the endless churches in these little villages around Midiat. I noticed that it is now on the tentative World Heritage Site list. So I think that's interesting because if it was to be taken onto the World Heritage Site list, presumably it would become much better known. Now, this is a particularly interesting church at Anukla Har, ha, the Church of the Virgin Mary. You can see there the importance of Gertrude's photos. On the left-hand side, you see that when she was there, the church had a dome and it had no, mineral, uh, no church tower. By the time I'm back there, the dome has fallen down it's been replaced with a sort of square superstructure. And in the 19th century, possibly earliest 20th century, a bell tower has been added to it. It was in Ha, Anukla, that Gertrude met with a big misadventure. So she pitched her tent nearby. And in the night, she woke up to find someone in the tent rummaging through her belongings. And that person ran away before she could stop them with all the notes that she'd taken on her journey down the Tigris and the Euphrates. So, I mean, that would have been a disaster. I mean, imagine how we feel if we've, in the old days when we lost a camera film or something, or we lost our diary or something. So it's all on our phones now. She could not let that go. So she raised a, a hue and a cry and people came from as far away as Midiat to pursue where these things had gone. And in the way of things, eventually everything came back except the money. And I think most of us know that in the end, unless you're destitute, that's what is most important. The, the money is usually the least important thing. What we want back is the pictures, the notebooks and so on. So she was happy with that. The place I had most wanted to see myself in the Turabdin was the monastery at Moor Algen, which is near Nusaibin. And I'd made one previous attempt to visit it, which had ended unsatisfactorily because some poor man had walked on the hillside and been blown up by a landmine. And not surprisingly, the taxi driver said, no, I'm not going up there. You know, you can walk if you like. I'm not going up there. So I had backed out. But in 2015, for those of you with memories, you will know that was a very tense time. So I was there in September 2015. And the atmosphere was very, very fraught at that time. The bomb had gone off in Suruch and everything was very unsettled. So it was not easy. I was determined to go there, but it was difficult to know how to, because you had to basically trust that someone you were employed as a taxi driver would take you to more Albion and nowhere else and not across the border where ISIS was or anything like that. I had, I was lucky. I got a nice taxi driver. I actually had someone sent with me as a hostage that I would be brought back. And when I got there, I met these two men. On the right is Father Joachim, who's the man who um, has restored 
Mo Albin, and who lives there alone. He's a priest monk. And on the left is Father Dale Johnson, who's one of only two Syrian Orthodox priests in the States. And he is a big Gertrude fan. And word was rippling around the tour Abdin that another strange British woman was wandering around visiting the churches. And he had waited to meet me and show me where it, Gertrude had described when she visited how there were 10 monks in residence, but the bishop had retreated into a cave that was high up and had told them that he would stay there till his death and he would send down a note when he thought that he was about to die and someone would then go up and collect his body. And Father Dale Johnson had waited to point that out to me um, and talk to me. And then when, when, when we'd finished chatting, we'd finished looking around, we went into the church and I lit a candle for Gertrude and they recited the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. And that was, you know, sixth century church. That was fantastically atmospheric and romantic and meaningful to me. And I would hope that it would have been to Gertrude had she been there. As I say, the worst problem I had actually was at Ephesus. But all hanging over my trip was the knowledge that Gertrude was a mountaineer. She actually has a peak named after her in the Alps, Swiss Alps. And while she was in Turkey, she climbed two mountains. The first one she climbed was this one, Judidar, which is over near Jizre. And at the top of it, there's this structure that was claimed to be Noah's Ark because the Kurds and the Syrian Orthodox believed that Noah's Ark came to rest here and not on Mount Ararat. Now, obviously, I think most of us would not think that was Noah's Ark. As far as I know, this is the only photograph that exists of this structure. So it's a very important photograph. But the security situation was such, there was no way I was going to be allowed to climb up Judy Dar. So I could relax about that one. I wasn't going to have to do that. <laughs> However, this one, I was going to have to do. This is Mount Hassan, which overlooks Western Cappadocia, so near Absarai. And it's a real, real mountain. It's 3,268 metres, it's 10,000 feet. And I, as you can see, am not an obvious mountaineering type. But it was very clear I was going to have to have a bash at this. And the difficulty is also that you can only really do this at certain times of year, because for much of the year, as you can see, it's covered in snow. And when it's not covered in snow, it's so hot that it would be very difficult to walk up. So I found exactly the right moment. And I set out with a mountain guide and um, a friend of his, people I knew from Abanos, actually, because I've lived in Gurame for a very long time. And we had a wonderful journey up there. There's no path, you just pick your way over rocks. And this is me. I did not get to the top, but I got within 300 meters. Now I would have liked to have said that I wanted to press on, but the mountain guide said to me that he thought we had to turn back. And although I wanted to argue with him, part of me just thinks this man does this for a living. He knows. And if he's telling you we have to turn back, you have to turn back. And he was quite right because by the time we got down, so it's taken us 10 hours there and back. By the time we got down, I was so exhausted that we drove on to look at a castle. And when we got there, I just said, I can't. You two are gonna have to go up there and tell me if there's anything interesting. I can't, I'm just finished. And I just lay on the back seat. Back seat. But Gertrude herself did say that she was exhausted from this trip. However, the way she did it, was not dragging herself up and dragging herself down, but going up, running around on the top, looking at innumerable churches, making a full start, coming down, going back up again and trying again. She was always better than me at all of these things. Gertrude's, Gertrude's journey ended here at Sketchy Station, as so many people's journeys did before planes um, took us away from traveling overland. I had one last stop. I went to Gallipoli because, as I've mentioned, the man that she loved, Dick Dowsey Wiley, was shot dead, as, as so many people were, at Gallipoli. And he's buried where he died. He's in a cemetery for one at Settlebyer. And so the thing that I felt that I could do for her was to go and visit his grave because I'm as sure as you can be that she never mm -hmm. saw it. So I went there. And now, because this is the month in which we're remembering the earthquakes. I want to end by looking a little bit at Antakya, which was the place that Gertrude wrote about. 
She was not, as you would expect, particularly interested in the Church of St. Peter, or at least she didn't write about it as if she was. She was particularly interested in what she called the Sphinx, which nowadays people seem to think is a carving of Sharon, the man who rode people across the sticks. And she wrote, if she could speak, she might tell us of great kings and gorgeous pageants, of battle and of siege, for she has seen them all from her rock on the hillside. And I'm assured that it has survived the earthquake. So it's still there. And if it's all right with you, I'm going to read you firstly what Gertrude herself wrote when she first arrived there, and then a little bit about what I wrote in my book. So this is from The Desert and the Sown, written in 1905, when she's coming back from Palestine and Syria. It was with some excitement that I gazed on the city of Antioch, which was for so many centuries a cradle of the arts and the seat of one of the most gorgeous civilizations that the world has known. Modern Antioch is like the pantaloon, whose clothes are far too wide for its lean shanks. The castle walls go climbing over rock and hill, enclosing an area from which the town has shrunk away. But it is still one of the loveliest of places, with its great ragged hill behind it, crowned with walls and its clustered red roofs stretching down to the wide and fertile valley of the Orontes. Earthquakes and the changing floods of the stream have overturned and covered with silt the palaces of the Greek and the Roman city. Yet as I stood at sunset on the sloping sward of the Musaria graveyard below Mount Sil Silpius, where my, tent, my, where my camp was pitched, and saw the red roofs under a crescent moon, I recognised that beauty is the inalienable heritage of Antioch. So that was Gertrude herself, and this is some part of what I wrote in the book. In the Afan Karbasi, at the southern end of Kuturish Jardasi, I find Harun, Harun Jamal holding court in front of a black and white photograph of the Antakya 50 years ago, when the Orontes flowed wide and free and the creaking of enormous water wheels peppered the evening air. Far from being an Arab Alevi, Harun is an even greater rarity, one of the last 16 Jews in a town that at the time of Alexander the Great boasted a roll call of 20,000. After Titus put down the great revolt against Roman rule in Palestine in AD 70, many Jews flocked north and resettled in Antakya. The congregation dipped in the Middle Ages after the introduction of laws that favoured Christianity, but recovered after the Ottomans occupied Palestine in the early 16th century. Now it has shrunk so much that two men must fly from Istanbul every Saturday to guarantee the minion of ten required for prayers. Harun leads me into a building that still flaunts the Star of David above its door. In the courtyard, what seems more like a chapel than a full-blown synagogue, sits alongside an abandoned school. Inside, he throws back the doors of the Ark to display a collection of Torah scrolls dating back to the start of Ottoman rule. On the walls hang memorials to his ancestors, originally from Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Most of the last Jews left not for Israel, but for Istanbul in the 1980s, he tells me. Why didn't you go too? I was born here. My relatives are buried in this soil. If I were to leave, soon there would be no Jews left here at all. As he locks the door behind him and shuffles back towards the cafe, it occurs to me that I have been observing him much as I would an endangered species of animal, a northern white rhinoceros in Kenya, for example. There is that same poignancy in learning of a crumbling in numbers to below the level of sustainability. And the fall has been precipitous. In Gertrude's day, there were still 500 Jews left in the city. And as recently as 2001, around 100 were still keeping the faith alive. Now the end is in sight. Harun may not be about to abandon his post, but soon there will be no one left to unlock the doors on Saturdays. The imminent demise of Judaism in Antakya is as certain as that of the last northern white rhino. And then this is the uh, footnote that we added just before going to press last year. The quakes of 2023 killed the head of the Jewish congregation and his wife and damaged the synagogue. The rest of the congregation left the city. So that is my memorial to Antakya. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Pat, and that very, very moving um, final uh, part there as well, um, just on Antakya. Um, I'd like to now invite, uh, I can see him just on the screen now, um, Mark Jackson. Um, and Mark Jackson is a professor of Byzantine archaeology at Newcastle University. 
and honorary secretary of the British Institute of Ankara. Um, so he teaches um, and researches late Roman and Byzantine archaeology at Newcastle. Um, but crucially, Mark is also the academic, um, I can't read my own writing here, but the, uh, the academic uh, leader of um, the Gertrude Bell photo um, Photographic Archive, which is a UNESCO international uh, memory of the world, which includes um, eight, I think it's 8,000 um, photographic images, mostly taken by Bell um, in the Ottoman Empire before World War I. Um, and he's also um, has a long history of working um, within the region that Bell um, travelled in and also um, with the BIA. So Mark will just be um, giving uh, some response to um, Pat's talk and uh, the, the book chapter. So Mark, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and thank you, Pat, particularly. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure um, to be asked to say a few words about your book, Pat, and in response to your, your lecture. Um, I should say I've got a particular love of this topic because my own connection with Gertrude Bell and the British Institute at Ankara goes back um, 30 years to when I traveled in the footsteps of Gertrude Bell as, as an undergraduate. And I went first to the British Institute in Ankara and then to Bin Bikilise on the advice of Professor Jim Crow, who's now the chair of the British Institute. So. Um, and who then was 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 um, looking after the the Gertrude Bell Photographic Archive in Newcastle. So um, I know that many others here listening will have their own stories. Perhaps um, visited some of these places. Perhaps followed um, by reading the books of Gertrude Bell, or perhaps worked with the archive. So on behalf of of everyone, I'd like to thank you for your talk, Pat, today, and for for stimulating us with with this volume. And for those who haven't had the opportunity to read it. Uh, following Miss Bell is um, it, it, it is just shy of 400 pages. It's it's a very enjoyable read, and I think um, a bit like the difference between a film and a book. Um, there's a depth and a detail in the book which we can't really do justice to um, in an hour. I've just been asked to confirm my language, so I'm going to I'm going to do that. In, I'm speaking in English. Um, <laughs> Um, and I think also um, we should, one of the things we should do is acknowledge Pat's long experience as a travel writer in Turkey. That that experience affords all kinds of insights into independent travelling, which I think perhaps um, come through in her narrative. And, and, and it's a different style of writing to, to a kind of an, an academic book. And I think that's particularly engaging. Pat wasn't travelling by car. Um, she was or independent car, and she's, she hadn't hired a car, she was traveling by taxi or by dolmush or perhaps on foot. And that enabled her to explore these places with multiple companions. And I think it, it lends, a, lends a, um, a real interest to what, she, what she's writing. Um, and so while the book's both a, a quest to discover the places that Gertrude visited, um, the narrative's also a way for, for, for the readers to join Pat meeting people along the way. And I think um, together with some informative discussion of the history and context of the places visited, um, one of the real pleasures is those, those people. As Pat explained, um, Bell travelled to Turkey on multiple trips before the First World War, and I think Pat's experiences um, are represented in this book alongside Bell's words with, with photos and some very clear maps, um, as well as Bell's uh, as, as Pat's own route. Um, it's 10 years ago this year, I think 2014 from my emails, that Pat first contacted the Gertrude Bell Archive to speak about her trip. And of course, much has changed then. Peter mentioned the UNESCO International Memory of the World status given to the archive. Um, we've got a new website for the archive. And one of the things that's been really helpful to us in the last few months is that following Pat's research, she's contributed a lot of the, the work that she's done on perhaps locating some of the places that have changed their names um, so that we can include that information in a project that we're, we're currently running to digitally um, locate the photographs and the letters and the diaries and the archive um, into digital map data. So that will be a, a future resource. And I think it's a really nice connection between um, research and archives and, and, and Pat's project. 
and and of course few of us would would have the time to make and research such a long project um 10 years is, is a long time and i guess pat there must have been a tension while you were traveling between the amount of time you spent with individual people and the kind of the quest to keep to keep moving um but but it clearly has been very much a labor of love and i think the book will um resonate with anyone who's had the pleasure of searching for more out of the way archaeological sites and particularly on their own in turkey and um while often the places of name have have, have changed and the, and and the um changed in their names and the sites have perhaps been hidden by modern development um i think your experience working for the lonely planet um really helps that narrative and i think um many will empathize with the way you turned up in some of those villages and suddenly all the all the people in the village were trying to help you find um these these places until perhaps one elderly gentleman um could remember and i think one of the themes perhaps you highlighted there if if indirectly is the is the importance of um something i think researchers are doing more now which is the importance of memory and oral history and it made me think about um the sort of precious time that we're in right now where these older generations who've li whose lives have covered so much time of change um how how you know we need to try and capture some of that um before it's too late and i think you do that um in the stories that you tell in your book very nicely um and and i, I was thinking also about the the way that journeys bring people together and the way that um your kind of co creating knowledge through the discussions that you have with these people. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to go on the British Institute's Pisidia Heritage Trail, but um, I think that's also a wonderful example of people walking a route, following a, following a, uh, following a journey. Um, and I think in that case, it goes hand in hand with that important um, tangible and intangible heritage research. And, and, I, and, I, and I like the sort of, um, the way that you're raising some of the um some of these non-official historians we, we we there were several people who you talked about who weren't officially historians but they had these amazing archives back in their offices of, of photographs that they gathered over over the years as well as those other local historians who are um the, just the people that dwell in the landscape live in the landscape um who, who had so much to offer um when, when you were looking for places um, and I, one other thing I really enjoyed was the way that um, when you told the story in the book, um, sometimes I forgot that I was reading a book written in the present and I was transported back to with the, the bells crossing of the Euphrates um, was, was, I thought, wonderfully um, captured. Um, and I thought it was fun sort of time traveling between the past and the present as we went through Bell's journeys and, and your own journeys. And and th there was a there were interesting elements of suspense and humor. You've just talked about um, being up that mountain and, and getting stuck on at Ephesus. I think loads of us would empathize with biting off more than we could chew, climbing up a mountain and suddenly it starts to get dark and we haven't quite realized how long it's going to take to get down through those thorny bushes. Um, but I thought there was also a, um, a an honesty really. There was one point where you, where you talked about being warned of robbers and seeing three men coming towards you on motorcycles and fearing the worst. And then they come over and ask if you need any help. And I thought there was a, um, there were some nice sort of little plot lines as, as we went through the story. Um, you, you met some interesting women on the, on the journey as well. Um, the last honorary British vice consul you talked about, and you, you compared yourself um, and your experiences with not just Belle, but some of these women that you met on the journey too. I thought um, almost the first 150 pages is about Western Turkey. And, and as a Byzantine archaeologist, I often think about in Bikilise, um, perhaps the Tur Abdin, and, and that's what comes into my mind when I'm thinking about Bell. But actually, um, certainly I'd never really thought about her time in Western Turkey because she wasn't really interested in classical archaeology. But I thought you you drew out really nicely the importance of her time with the Van Lennops and the Whittles, those kind of Levantines, as you call them, in, in Western Turkey. Um, and, and I loved some of that, you know, you, 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 um, you, you mentioned um, going through a door in a wall like a wardrobe in Narnia into an English garden. Um, and, uh, and I thought that was, uh, that, that was, that was an area of, of, of her work that I hadn't really appreciated um, properly. 
um, as we as we've heard, Bell travelled for some fifteen years through Turkey, and of course, every decade seems to be characterised by important events. And the last ten years, while you've been writing this book, have themselves been very tumultuous. Um, and I thought um, you engaged with that um, very carefully, and and um, and and, it, and clearly that was something that you put a lot of thought into. Um, it might be interesting to hear more about that. But um, you talked, for example, about um, refugees who you met who'd fled to Turkey from Syria, um, and and also um, as you've just talked about the the final edit, I guess, must have included information about the terrible earthquakes last year. Um, Bell has some very problematic attitudes, um, particularly when we look back over a hundred years later, she's very disparaging about some people and places. Um, um, I think you talk about the many hardships experienced by people um, in a more empathetic way. Um, and, I, and I wonder how how you found that process of of kind of reconciling Bell's views with your own, but I've, I, I sort of thought I'd finish with three three questions. Um, firstly, really wondering about that your your process of preparation and research and writing, because clearly you were researching before you travelled, but then you travelled, and it's been quite some time since since travelling that you've 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 finalised the publication. Um, obviously, there's been some major development and massive change in Turkey, but. I was wondering also about what what similarities strike you about your experience more than a century um, after Bell's. Um, what what kind of things do you feel that you particularly shared with her? And I think it was also striking how, in some places, um, the visit made by Gertrude so long ago was particularly remembered. Um, and I wonder why you think that is. Why do people uh, in remote areas of, of, of Turkey remember Bell so fondly or so so perceptively so um at the end of your book there's a long list of acknowledgements um and I think as well as the people mentioned um what's very clear is your project has connected very many people together um, it's a very stimulating project um and I, I guess on behalf of everyone here and um and those who read your book thank you very much for for sharing it with us and um and we look forward to questions Thank you, Mark. I feel thoroughly embarrassed. You've been so kind in what you've said. That's so very nice of you. Um, some of what, you, what you've just asked, I mean, the easy bit, why people resonated in, in Turkey. I mean, my, my experience of Turkey is that if people know nothing about Gertrude Bell, and I say that I'm doing some work about Gertrude Bell, they say, oh, Jazus, which means spy. And obviously that's a pretty solid wall, so you don't get very far with that. But usually they don't actually know anything. But all over Turkey, I bumped into people in the most unlikely places. The first Gertrude fan I met was in Aydın, standing on the steps of a jami, and I thought he was the imam for some reason, and waited to say, I think the restoration has been very nice. And he said, oh, no, I'm an English teacher. And I said, oh, I'm following Gertrude. But, oh, Gertrude, he said. And it turned out he was a huge fan. And the reason was almost always the photographs. Because Gertrude's photographs are often the earliest either known photographs of specific areas or the only ones that anyone's got any access to, largely due to the wonderful archive. So I met many people like that who were very aware of Gertrude and grateful because she is the first person who's left a, a record of their, their village, even if they can't read the, the archival stuff, they can look at the pictures. Um, in terms of you know how it was for her and I I mean yes we had obviously we had different attitudes to things I mean famously Gertrude was anti votes for women and that seems extraordinary when many people see her as an icon for women really um, but then I would always come back as someone interested in history I would always come back to I don't believe you can judge people by the by the standards of a hundred years later I mean, I'm quite sure in 100 years time, people would, if we survive 100 years time, I'm sure people will say, you mean you used to keep chickens in enormous, great, big battery farms? But we do that. And we don't think there's anything particularly odd about that. So I think I was always kind of conscious she had the views of her time and of her class. And to try and judge that is probably quite pointless, really. I mean, 
yeah, I, I mean, I think if she were living now, she probably wouldn't be against votes for women. But she was living in a time when that was a thing that people could think. I mean, the clear difference between our two experiences was people sometimes think that she was traveling alone. She was always the only woman, but she was never traveling alone. She was always with an entourage of guides or um, custodians. She always had her manservant far too with her. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I actually was sometimes literally alone. And sometimes that wasn't always as wonderful as it might have been. There were a couple of, I thought, rather unfortunate near incidents that, you know, I got round. So there was that issue. She also had a gun, which, of course, I didn't. So, um, you know, in that sense, she was more protected than I was, although obviously the conditions in which she was traveling were so much harsher. So I wasn't having to contend with deep mud everywhere. So I wasn't having to wait to cross rivers with some, you know, flimsy barge. I was just sort of crossing on the bridge or taking a good ferry or something. The other thing that was a difference, of obvious difference, is that she was from a moneyed background. So there really wasn't any issue about that. Whereas there were parts of Turkey I would have loved to have spent more time looking at. But I simply couldn't because this project cost me an enormous amount of money. Mm -hmm. And there had to be a point at which you would say, you know, what you would get out of that trip in terms of the book project is so little, you can't justify how much it would cost you in terms of hiring a taxi driver, spending days away. So I think that was another difference between us. I mean, I wish it hadn't been because, you know, I would have liked to have been everywhere she'd gone. But realistically, I couldn't. So I don't know if that helped with your question. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Um... And Peter, are we are we to open things up, or how, what's the best thing for us? Yes, to do? yes, exactly. Uh, thanks very much, Mark, for um, that response. That was a um, yes, thank you. Yeah, Mark. that was a a real tour de force in being a discussant. So thank you very much. Um, so now I'd like to open up for questions and answers from the audience and also from Zoom as well. Um, just to remind the audience, though, if you don't get the chance to ask your question now, we will be having a small drinks reception, so you can also ask Pat more informally there as well. Um, so is there anyone from the audience? Ah, Michaela, there we go. Thank you, Pat, that was really great. Um, and uh, it's also a very, very different perspective than, than what I'm usually, I'm, I'm used to when, when thinking about guests as well. Um, I'm also working in Konya, that was mentioned to you earlier. And I uh, was wondering, I mean, it's a place that I learned to love, but it, it's a difficult place. Um, and I, I, I wonder, you know, even for a woman a hundred years ago, it, must, it might have been even more uh, harsh. Uh, as a, and uh, so I, because also, it, among other things, it's very far away from the normal grand tour that uh, the European were, were going through. So I was wondering, A, why was she there? And B, what was her experience um, as a woman then? And who were the people she was meeting? What does she say about the people she was meeting? Probably she was mostly meeting men, but did she ever, ever meet any women there? Um, well, why she was there, I would think it was just, if you, in the past, I mean, we just go from one place to the next. I personally hate doing that. I like to travel over land. But if you travel over land, you go to a lot of places literally because they are on the road. So Konya was always on the road and the railways went there. A lot of what came out of this project was the importance of the railways in dictating where people went. Um, I don't think it was harsh for her at all. I don't think she had any, I, there's nothing to me in what she wrote about Konya that I've seen that suggests she had any problems because she was in the circle at the consulate um, she there were there were missionaries in Konya at that time that she spent time with, and there were a lot of um, probably sort of intellectually type um, Ottomans who had fallen foul of the uh, Sultan and been exiled. It was a place of internal exile. Um, so she talks about a particular place where you'd go and you would meet all the sad exiled people, you know, wishing that they could go back to Constantinople, but they couldn't because they were out of favour. So as regards women, yes, well, she, she met um, Dick Doughty Wiley's wife and you know, went shopping with her. Um, she also met 
female missionaries that were there. So in fact, her circle in Konya was a pretty small and elite band of people, frankly. Um, that's my I'm thinking about it now, as I haven't really thought. I'm thinking that's probably as close as the circles that say she moved in in Constantinople itself. Um, I mean, in some ways, you know, like the bubbles that we all live in, probably. Um, I personally have a great affection for Konya. I don't really know why that is, but I do. Um, <laughs> I've always thought if you if alcohol isn't an issue for you, um, this is probably. You know, if you were a middle class Turkish, um, a fairly devout Turkish person, I would have thought Konya offered a pretty good deal, frankly. It seems to me to be quite a well run municipality. Um, I was noticed things sort of that it surprises me that it's not behind the times, it's often ahead of the times. Um, and I met, I mean, I did, I suppose my contacts would have started with people I'd met in the Lonely Planet days. Um, who then would have passed me on to people around town. Um, so my social circles were always much less elite than Gertrude's. I didn't have that access at all. I was usually with the taxi drivers and the, you know, the, the run of the mill sort of people. But there I did meet someone who was a modern archaeologist who was, um, they were laying and they were extending the, the metro at that time with the tram. And uh, Nuretin, who I spent some time with, was looking at all the stuff that was coming up. I have to say that when I visited the Konya Museum, I was not wildly welcome. Um, they were very suspicious of me, but then, you know, I have a sympathy with that. I mean, it appears that, uh, you know, the German consul at the time removed a very fine uh, Mirab to Germany without any right to do so. So, I mean, while, it, while obviously being unwelcome isn't particularly pleasant, I don't find it that surprising. So, as I say, I have quite a soft spot for Conny, really. Okay, uh, should we just take one question from online, then a question from here? Uh, okay, this question is uh, from John Crawford. Thank you, Pat, for this wonderful presentation and the valuable and informative book. Question about Gidre, which you visited at such a difficult time. Despite the atmosphere, uh, did people there share thoughts about what the sites on your itinerary meant to them? Well, that was very, very strange, because by the time I went to Jizre, I mean, for those of you who remember our recent history, there had been one siege of Jizre. It had been closed down and you, no one could go in or out and the electricity and everything had been cut off. And I, first of all, I thought I couldn't go because it didn't seem very realistic. And then I sort of thought, well, you know, traffic is flowing. I mean, it, presumably it is OK to go now. So I found a taxi driver who was prepared to take me and we went there. And what surprised I mean, you sort of, when you're doing a project like this, you, you live in a sort of surreal world, really. So I'm going around with my list of things that Gertrude had seen, trying to find them in this town that has only just come out of a siege and doesn't know it, but it's about to go into another one. Um, and, you know, I go into this old Belladea building where they're organising um, handicraft uh, classes for women and people are signing up to do Ebru and are signing up to do SAS. And I'm looking around for a carving of a, um, a lion. I think I was looking for a lion and I couldn't find it. And eventually I went back in and came out with my spiel that I was following Gertrude Bell and she'd seen this lion. They said, oh yes, Gertrude. And they took me back and went through and looked at this. And in that case, I mean, I felt I've got to sort of come up with some kind of explanation because they must think I'm insane wandering around at this time. Um, and I said to them, shall I go to Thunuk where, where Gertrude had been and there were some Parthian, Parthian monuments I'd have liked to have seen. They said, oh no, Abla, not now, not until after the elections. And it was because there were two elections that year. Um, I'm sure you know, don't need me to tell you that. Um, so on the one hand, we, we all knew that the situation was not normal, but on the other hand, life goes on. So, you know, you continue to offer your class in Ebru, and I continue to go around asking, where's the carving of the lion? It's it's just a strange sort of... Anyway, thank you, John, for that question. John was someone who I knew from Hassan Cave before it was drowned. Okay, so uh, Fahri. Okay, thank you for this uh, great lecture. And um, when I look at the map she traveled, uh, I was thinking the the railway construction of Ottoman Empire in this period because 
uh, the uh, the lines her travel lines parallel to uh, uh, Berlin Bada railway and maybe Hijab railway. So, is there any uh, correlation uh, between uh, this very strategical railway uh, projects of Germany and in, in English uh, reactions against this uh, railways? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, one of the things. I mean, before I started work, I didn't I didn't realize that railways were going to be as important as they became. I mean, I ended up spending a lot of time looking for railway stations, including one that I went in search of that doesn't exist anymore and was built only because the contract was paid by the kilometer. And so this station was built in the middle of nowhere to fulfill the terms of the contract. And it was actually handy for someone going up to Bimbe Kalise. So Gertrude had been to it several times and I went into a coffee shop. So I went to a taxi driver and said, I want to go to the site of the Bulgaluk uh, station. Oh, Abla, it's been pulled down. I said, yes, but I want to see the site. And you know, he took me into a tea house and we found a man who said he knew where it was. And we went off on a crazy sort of journey to look for this non-existent station. So I, my impression of Gertrude, people think of her as this woman on a horse. Um, and there was a point very early on when I thought I would go around on a horse. And then I changed my mind after coming into Diabaka one day and thinking, and when did you think you were going to put that horse? The Hassan Pasha Han that she stabled her horses in is a breakfast place now. And then I went through the Adana Mersin conurbation. And again, I'm thinking, where did you think you were going to put a horse? That day is gone. That, that's finished. You can't do it like that. But my feeling was that Gertrude herself was a very pragmatic person. She wasn't interested in doing something and proving it by a horse, I don't think. She was interested in going to places and seeing things. And she took whatever mode of transport was available, which, as you've pointed out, was often the railway, the expanding rail network. So whenever there was a train, Gertrude was using it. So she was using it along that line that they were building to Baghdad, and she was using it to get to Tarsus, and she was using it to get to Izmir and so on. So I think the railway actually dictated an awful lot of where people went at that time and places that they didn't go. So, I mean, she didn't go to the south coast well there was no railway there was no road so i think often where people went is dictated by infrastructure and the railway was obviously very important at that time okay so we're just going to take one last question from line but before i say that i should also say that contrary to normal visitors uh, to the bia uh, pat did actually come to ankara on a horse rather than the railway. <laughs> 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 we have another question from uh, John McKenna. Uh, when Gertrude uh, climbed Hatanda and beat the churches to the east, did she mention standing on or near the Temple Foundation remnants on the eastern Caldera Ridge? Where was that on Hasanda? Yeah. Um, I don't remember her mentioning castle at the uh, temple. That doesn't mean she didn't. She may have done. I remember mainly the castles, the, the churches, and her saying that we didn't know which Hassan it was. You know, it's a there's a some sort of structure that would be a sort of a shrine to Hassan, but we don't know which Hassan could be any Hassan, really. I don't specifically remember. And obviously, as we know, I didn't get up there and was very disappointed because I've heard, maybe someone would know, that Milka had placed a large advertising thing of a cow on the top of Mount Hassan. And I was really keen to see that um, or disprove it. I don't know. I've never heard whether that's there. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, I also just want to say, so uh, Mark very helpfully mentioned earlier um, the BIA's Pacifica Heritage Trail. Um, we'll actually have more information about that going up very soon, but that's on the from the 1st to the 5th of May. And those of us who are in the room can see the advert for it here. That will actually be taking place. Um, and that's been set up by my colleague, uh, Shalai uh, Gursu, who's the other assistant director of the BIA. So if, um, if you're interested. Um, but first of all, let's, I mean, last of all, even, um, let's uh, join me in uh, congratulating and thanking Pat for this very interesting talk. And also, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your applause. And <laughs> also to Mark and uh, joining us from Newcastle as well. Thank you very much.
And then please do join us for a glass of wine or water um, and some chats. And Thanks can I much. just say, I did bring with me a few copies of the book because it cannot, you can't buy it in Ankara because this, the publisher doesn't have a distributor. So I brought a few copies with me and if anyone wants to buy them, it will save me taking them back to Istanbul with me when I go. Thank you. <laughs>